warm welcoming you back to this show, Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. This happens to be the 337th show and you're past our 19,000 viewer, which we appreciate. And we're broadcasting live from the opposite ends of the world with you, our producer and co-host Jay Fidel, and you, Martin Ancelini, who came to us from your country of Colombia to us in Hawaii about a year ago. And on the other end of the spectrum and the world, you have me, Martin Despang, this time near uh, Dresden, Germany, not in Munich. I stopped by at the Despang Architect headquarters, also with my parents and folks who say hi. And we were just before the show getting warmed up, gentlemen, to talking about autocracies and totalitarian regimes. And we also said we want to get the hopes up high, uh, never mind um, the uh, tragic news about Venezuela. And so on that note, um, Jay, you had been in uh, Barcelona, the city we're continuing to shed a light on actually during the Francoist regime, which is as totalitarian and autocratic as you can get it, about 10 years before it came down. And uh, where I'm sitting here is where in 1989, uh, Germans, after they, we use the term fucked up before and getting warmed up uh, in other circumstances, Jay, this is what we Germans did big times uh, to your <laughs> culture, which I will always feel bad about. And in 89, we were kind of surprising the world because we showed we can do better because we took a totalitarian regime down in a peaceful way. So that on these sort of more hopeful notes, and we will now see how, you know, uh, cities and cultures can thrive after they came out of totalitarian regimes as well architecturally. And this is your slide, Martin. You took this when you were there about 15 years ago as, as a student and refresh your memory, our memory, your memories and share with us what you found exciting about this uh, very different high rise or skyscraper, however you want to call it. Yeah, actually, I have here in my laptop uh, the image that you took now, 15 years later, uh, and it's practically the same i think we saw we saw the same thing is uh, first of all this uh, double facade which is something that we have to really uh, uh, think about it many modernistic building even from the first half of the, uh, the last century were thinking about uh, light and heat control uh, this building is doing it in a very in a very elegant way i think this these double fa facades are expensive but if you think about how much energy you save by generating uh, 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 a louver system that protects the internal facade, uh, you will for sure after some five, maximum ten years, you will save uh, a lot of a lot of money, a lot of economical resources. Then there is something beautiful that I saw in this facade that you have probably seen is that behind this. Uh, uh, glass uh, louvers, you find uh, a very colorful, uh, suggestive system. No, you can uh, even think about this as something explicit, probably too explicit, but I think it is elegant. No, it's pretty elegant how uh, the 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 colors. I, I remember John Novell at that time was talking about uh, hell and heaven and and these kind of things uh, when he was uh, uh, selecting the colors for this Torak bar. Um, that it is pretty uh, uh, global as a tower, but at the same time, uh, it is local. No, it is talking about uh, somehow the mosaics of Barcelona, the colors, the colors of, of Park Güell, uh, uh, and so on. Yeah, and this is about kind of the text you're talking about. Um, at the beginning, it says it becomes a symbol, a new symbol of an international city. Uh, Jean Nouvel, by the way, this sounds French. This does not sound Spanish. So it is. It's a it's a French architect. So, you know, the Spanish people were pretty welcoming, talking welcoming cultures and societies. They were doing this. And here is that text. If you guys, you know, have a chance to read a glimpse through that, it is very sort of a mystical, almost an esoteric description um, of a project that otherwise 
um, reminds us of something um, in a very sentimental, romantic way. Jay, you remember that from back home in Honolulu, the Ala Moana building, how it used to look like we had never had the chance to see it. Um, it had it had louvers. It had I always call it a, a performative feather cape on, and that was um, you know as a practicing architect being at the headquarters of our office. If I want to suggest, and you, Martin, as well, coming we both coming from practice, even in these <laughs> days, if we suggest to any kind of client who do buildings like that, um, high rises, to do either a double facade or a um, electronically controlled uh, louver system, we will have a really, really hard time. But back in these days of the Soto's uh, statehood, childhood days, in 1959, this was John Graham. This was not a boutique architect. This was not a Jean Nouvel. It was a dry cut American mall developer architect. And even these people were pra pragmatically poetic, poetically pragmatic. And uh, since I think like 20%, I was told because I had an emergency dentist in that building that still exists, but it's basically one stole its cape and it's naked now. And um, it's 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 a shame. And, uh, you know, somewhere in these horrible 90s that I had to go to architecture school, we were totally lost. Some douchebag people were saying, hey, you know, we, we have to maintain these. We have to grease that or sometimes fix the wires. That's like too much work for us. Why don't we take them off and just beef up the AC? This is what happened to the building. And this is this is tragic. Right. So we had that as well. What you said so spot on and right on, Martin, the building that you saw 15 years ago that we just sent me there to see it again is there. It just looks as good and uh, everyone is proud of it. Why are we not proud of the things that we had that we could have been so proud of in Honolulu? That's a question. And yeah. uh, probably maybe unfair to ask you, Jay, why, but feel free to. Well, I, you know, it's interesting how... That building was iconic, um, and am I thinking of the same building? It's the one on um, on Kapiolani, uh, yes. just Malka of the shopping center. Yes, and yes. Uh, it was interesting that it became a medical a medical office building because when you see an office building turn into a medical office building, you know there has been a, uh, a transition, if not a transformation, of the way that building works. Um, so there was a time when it was a, strictly an office building, and then it became a medical office building. And at the top, originally, and this was talk about romance, at the top was a, a moving, moving floor that turned around 360 degrees. So if you went there, and there was a restaurant, and you went there, there still is, but it doesn't move anymore. If you went there in the good old days, you could see the whole city in the course of an hour. Um, you could see the views from every point of the compass. And that was a beautiful thing. But then something went wrong, the, the failure of that technology. And what they did is, ready? are you sitting down? What they did is nothing. It just got <laughs> stuck. And it stopped turning. And it hasn't turned for decades and decades which is really sad. It was sad they designed it that way. It was sad they couldn't maintain it properly. And it was sad they didn't do anything at all when it stopped moving. That's the Ala Moana building. So true. And that's why we like show quotes. Uh, this picture here is a show quote from a show that is about that building, coolest commercial classic. It was, in fact, one of the first. There's the number. 326 so if you count back from 337 jay this was about our 10th or 11th show that's how hot it was for us to talk about it you should go back to that show and watch it all the goodies that you've been talking about um and again uh, what we talk about in the show that is john graham tested that in our Honolulu for the year later, where he designed the Space Needle in Seattle, same architect for the World Fair. So we were that coolest place on the planet where you test it out. And with testing, Jay, I have to say, it goes prototyping and things can go wrong. 
But that technology is still pretty, you know, I wouldn't say medieval, but pretty mechanic, right? So they could have fixed that. They just did not want to fix it. And I once, way back when Joey was visiting me the first time, we actually broke into the thing, I have to say. there is, um, It didn't take much. We didn't do that break into a lock. We just had to find an elevator after the main elevator and get us straight into it. And the whole thing was empty. Some person had put like a, a, a pretty bizarre condo into it with mirrored, you know, ceilings and stuff like that. You've got to wonder what that was. But we were there. That was all gutted and it was all empty. And this is talking capital concentration, right? This is prime real estate in the heart of Honolulu. How can you even from a financial point of view? But maybe let's leave it there and, and go inside because we don't want to judge a book by the cover because the Alamoana building as well, it felt cool from inside because these louvers were shading you from the sun. And this is the similarity to the Torah Akbar that, however, takes a very different approach. Um, it takes the approach to say, I don't even let that get that that much sun and heat into the building. That's why the actual... A concrete structure that's also unique is a perforated um, uh, stereotomic massive thing and you only got you know so many windows in there and then so this is this is the view from that sort of commercial building how it is in there it's not a glass box it appears as a glass box and this website here points out how the buzzword of sustainable bioclimatic that building is and it has several features that make it um, likely performing much better than any of the high rises ever since these glorious days. And also, let's be jealous about jealousies, right? Because we saw this building has jealousies. So like in 2005, you make jealousies while at that time, Jay, I, I once heard there were like 10 or 11 je glass jealousy manufacturers in Honolulu. Now there's not even two left of them because we all went to fix glazing, ACing. And that beautiful yeah. thing that does it is single pane glass that you can open and close. And technology has involved. We're really jealous of that. Um, in fact, the show quote at the top right, our probably most relevant architect, another Gunter, um, you know, first name buddy of my father, Gunter, Gunter Banish was always into jealousies and uh, has worked with his company Glassbau Han that have perfected the glass uh, jealousy into a triple pane glass passive house system. So if we want to do a compromise, you know, between maybe, you know, the people who develop these high rises and they want to say, well, and when it's really hot in the summer, you know, maybe we need to AC a little bit when then please keep that AC air inside and don't let it sort of vanish away through single pane glass that doesn't work so there's so much potential there that we are not untapping into yet so let's move on in barcelona because another advantage is you get that um, express bus that shuttles you from the airport we talked about that last time and you're already driving by other high rises and this one here to the left there, right next to the bus driver, is another one that you probably just missed, Martin, if I'm not mistaken, because it was built just after the Tor Akbar, but it's just by the same architect, uh, Jean Nouvel. Um, this, is a, this is a hotel. And uh, in the middle of that, you see something really interesting. And I should have thrown in the show quote of that show you did, Jay, with Scott Wilson about green high rises and vegetated high rises that you did a long time ago. So guys, rewatch that one. So in Barcelona, around the time you were saying that, uh, Jay, they were doing it in Barcelona. And so there's a couple of interesting features. This is the view from your hotel room out to the city, which is quite interesting and quite bizarre, but maybe even more, you know, making us jealous is that there's a jungle the circulation of that hotel is a vertical jungle. And you yeah. know, Barcelona, yes, it is a temperate climate. It is mild, but in the wintertime, it gets down to like 
where people would feel they freeze to death in Honolulu, which is like lower 50s, right? No one can stand that who grew up in Hawaii. They always say, then I will die, right? But you don't physically, mm -hmm. spiritually, emotionally, you do. So again, they do this here in Barcelona in a climate that isn't as privileged as ours. They can get it done. So why don't yeah, we? I, this was your point, Jay and Scott. That that what brings me, Martin, to the to the idea of of looks. No, if you go to the websites that are promoting all the developments in Kakako that look so cheap to us, they all talk about luxury. No, and uh, what's more luxurious to have than having these few from your hotel room? Instead of just having a, a living inside a microwave where like nothing is happening inside, no. So design uh, the quality of spaces, the richness of of uh, let's say special special experiences. It is also loose, uh, and and we would say that we can bring this discourse to back to Honolulu because it was here before. Just the space of, of for example, that we were talking about in Naramoan. And not to get us wrong, we were you know fostering and and you know promoting you know welcomingness and and inclusivity of course of getting architects not just from your own breed but other ones but it should not go this is what these are probably good to show and to share it doesn't mean that you know getting hooked on a star architectural influx is a good thing because the one on the right is by dominic perot as well and the one on the left is by toyo ito and we had Shigeru Ban coming, you know, and basically meaning well, but maybe doing not so well on, on in Lahaina, dropping one of his things he had done before, which is a hermetic hut. And he had done some tents elsewhere in Morocco. He maybe should have done that. So we should be careful about an, an architectural fashion show because these buildings here are not very innovative. They basically, you know, punched old facades that... Um, that maybe don't cut it. So it's not everything in 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 um, you know in in Barcelona is and, and this one is we should three guys here we shouldn't be chauvies and machos at all. So if there's any woman out there as an architect, we should say she gets an extra advantage. Yes, but then again, please, dear Odell Delk here, maybe that building that you have finished, you know, isn't quite cutting it because it reminds us of our very recent show of Trouble Tropics Coconut Brying, where colleagues do the same thing. Yes, they provide lanais, but they provide it the same way around every fenestration and the sun, you know, rises somewhere and sets somewhere and has different angles. So you just shouldn't shouldn't ignore the environment, right? That 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 as well. And these are architects. Maybe you want to talk about um, basically um, uh, Mirales and Taglibu a, a little bit, Martin. Yeah. Uh, I, no, I, uh, this guy is one, uh, at least it was because I, he, he's dead uh, at a very young age, uh, Enric Miralles, uh, one of the most interesting Spanish architects of, of these recent years. I had the opportunity to meet uh, Benedetta Talia Bue in a conference. Now I think everything got a little bit too, let's say, superficial, like more about the colors of my skirt and this kind of like uh, fancy stuff, which is good. I mean, we can accept uh, some sometimes when they put aesthetics uh, on top of the uh, architectural decisions. I think it is not. It was not the case for me. I just, it was very rich. His architecture in terms of of plasticity, colors, shapes, and so on, as we see here with this huge cantilever. This is uh, at least it was the Gas Natural Tower, the Natural Gas uh, Office Tower. Um, this was one of his many projects. Uh, we were talking uh, uh, before about uh, Mercat Santa Caterina, that is also a very beautiful market, a renovation of an old market that was existing there before. Um, uh, we should look at, uh, at, uh, at this guy. I think the, that office is not as interesting as it used to be back when I was in Barcelona. That was kind of their top moment. Yeah. And that one, the market, uh, Jay, per your special request about public spaces and places that for good reason interest you the most. 
we will make a show where that market is included. And your point is well taken that a typology of a high rise is a very tricky one that, you know, even very talented and meaning well architects can get sidetracked as one probably both of us feel as it was in this building. So that being said, um, let's go to better examples that and and these are buildings here that were around pretty fresh when you were there, Martin, right? Yeah, they call it at that time Sarajevo because it was just we were getting out from the war of the Balkans. And as you see, it looks like a bombed building because of its actually it is very rich. No, I, I, I really love that building because it really shows that there is people inside. No, uh, of course, having this double, even triple facade would be more expensive at the beginning. Uh, but it makes, first of all, it makes the internal experience rich. Then it avoids what in many uh, uh, cases happens, for example, here at the Golden Coast, where all the balconies are getting closed by people uh, and a seat. So people, the people that want to, wants to close it, they can do it without like, uh, uh, destroying the original uh, idea uh, of the facade. Uh, plus, you can control the facade depending on where the when where the where the, the time of the year, the position of the sun, and so on, which is great. And and this is the beginning of something that we want to really rub into the you know policymakers in Honolulu is like, why don't we make shade a code requirement? that your building has to address to shade itself. As you know, we do as people, when we go, us two bald guys, you know, we have to wear a hat or sunscreen, otherwise we get skin cancer, Jay. That's just a given thing and it's hard to argue. Why don't we apply this to buildings as well? Why do we allow buildings to become sick buildings? There's a term in the medical realm, the sick building syndrome. And I think we're highly infected by that in Honolulu, by an overall sick building syndrome. So that's why we're sharing here a healthy building syndrome or phenomenon here, where buildings in one way or another, and these are maybe uh, examples that aren't are kind of questionable, the one to the left here that looks like a barcode, I was uh, quite um, sort of astonished, to say the least, to have found out that it was by David Shipperfield, who I consider to be my informal mentor. So I was not very too enthused about it. Also, he did this sort of uh, justice uh, complex here that um, is, is very kind of... But let's not talk style. Let's talk performance. He he basically says it's like a tree. Um, the tree has porosity. There's voids between the leaves. And you can say that this might be calculated, modeled after what a tree does. So like it or not, architecturally, you might find it too um, neo, um, you know, rational, but uh, climatically it might. And so when when architects work with uh, screens, that has, if it is as successful as it wants to come across in this project here, I was trying to find out, and that's what we want you, the audience, to do as well. But this is a building, for example, that is absolutely, without any doubt, shading. It's, it's, it's the same as the Alamana building. The Alamana building, Jay, is a glass box, but it got covered with a self-shading louver screen. So why we butchered that in Honolulu at the other end of the world and a fellow maritime metropolis architects get really super excited about what we neglect and ignore and don't even want to remember. How about that? So many thoughts, Martin, you know, I mean, for example, they're closing the building up and forcing air conditioning in every corner of it uh, may make the, owners or tenants happy that they can, you know, get an environment that's cooler than outside. But the reality is the utility company is having, you know, increasing challenges. And the cost of a, a kilowatt hour is, is and will continue to increase. So the more we rely on air conditioning for these big buildings, 
um, the more impossible it gets. It gets impossible on the utility. It gets impossible on the cost and the operating expense for that building. And there's a number of things you mentioned, I think, that are that are really worth uh, emphasizing. Number one is we should have it open. Two is we should have shade. Three is, <clears throat> is since we're so challenged on square footage, I don't really feel, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I don't feel that tiny little postage stamp lanais uh, are of any value. It's better to leave that space inside, but open the windows and put shade on the glass and so forth um, <clears throat> and, and save money and save space. The, the one other point I want to make before you throw me off here is that <clears throat> the juxtaposition of these buildings is important. In other words, when you build a monumental structure, you have to have a, an awareness of what's next door or what will be next door. And if you build them without any concern about what's next door across the street, uh, you wind up with something that's not very aesthetic at all. So and that's, that's not the individual developer or capital concentration, to use that term. Um, it's the Department of Planning and Permitting. They have to be aware uh, of the juxtaposition of the mm, of the, um, the the com the compatibility of one building with another, and the last point I want to make is that is that I want to refer to Hong Kong. Uh, in Hong Kong, uh, there are huge huge buildings. It's impressive how many buildings there are that are so big, so huge. And if you look at them from the street, you say, my goodness gracious, these are monumental structures. And, and it almost makes you think that's a good thing. Um, but in fact, if you go inside the building, it's ugly. The whole building is ugly. Um, without getting to the question of glass and air conditioning, of which there, I don't think they have air conditioning in these buildings. Um, it's, it's for people who you know, can't afford better and and who um, have no choice about it. And the design of the inside really is ugly. So what I'm, uh, you know, you are showing pictures of these monumental structures that are, uh, are some of them are really beautiful. Some of them are very functional and green, but I think we also have to look inside. We have to see the floor plans of the units and the floors. Because if, if I want to make a building the world will remember, if I want to be, you know, a, a famous architect, for example, for the generations to come, uh, I want the inside to be aesthetic also. And, and I don't think we're doing that. Um, one has to match the other. Just as being compatible with the structures across the street, I think if you're trying to send a message here, um, we have to send a message on the inside design just as well. I remember a building here in Honolulu uh, where they put the water heaters, individual water heaters, in the clothing closets in the bedroom. So if you had clothing, your clothing was going to get heated up. And they did this in every single unit in this multi-million dollar project. I mean, per unit. I'm saying, wow, somebody missed the boat. So I'm saying the inside design is also very important. Absolutely, Jane. We take you up on that one because we also got to talk about the, the, the function of the building. These are pre predominantly buildings where you work in. And, you know, COVID changed everything and COVID is still around. So, you know, people are not as much in these buildings to begin with. So it is even more important what you said, which is important anyways for our buildings in which you live, in which you reside, residential buildings, right? And you also said the ones we really have to increasingly care for is the people who can't afford that much, right? And that's absolutely for some more episodes going to Barcelona to look at what they're doing so much better on that end in Barcelona social housing as we call it or affordable housing mostly by the government for the little people in a beautiful way inside out that automatically then creates it being appealing from the outside maybe in a non-conventional way but still so that being said that has to be a closing note because we're reaching the end of another exciting uh, 30 minutes here but also we want to point out the show quotes at the top 
these are shows with DeSoto a long time ago. We called it uh, Corbu Hawaii Bris Soleil. This is about we have a legacy, we have a tradition in Honolulu that we were able to do this right. So all we have to do is not reinvent a wheel. The wheel is already there. We just got to dust off that wheel and grease it a little bit and oil it and keep it rolling again. You know, doing buildings that make sense in the way we're discussing it. So more on that one. There's more literally and figuratively cool buildings from our fellow Maritime Metropolis Barcelona. See you for that next week again. Bye-bye.